Excuse me, if I could have everyone's attention for just a second. I know some people are still getting food, so we don't want to stop you. Go ahead and make your plates and then make your way to your seats as quietly as possible. Before we start, there are a couple of people and groups I'd like to bring um, your attention to and actually show our appreciation for their co-sponsoring this event. We have the Healthcare Law Association. We have the, I believe the American Constitution Society, the Stetson Democrats, and I believe the Stetson Republicans as well have all put together and uh, put this event on for you. Um, also, we have three professors here, Professor Morrissey, Professor Finch, and Professor Torres Bellacy, who will provide input and possibly ask questions as our speaker presents. And now for our speaker, Mr. Joshua Blackman, who prefers to be called Josh. Josh is good. Yeah, not Mr. Blackman. He's an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law who speci specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. Josh is the author of the critically acclaimed book, Unprecedented, the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, which he'll be speaking on uh, right after I'm done talking. Um, personally, I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Blackman last summer at the uh, United States Supreme Court reception. It was an awesome experience. We had a moment to uh, speak, and that's how he ended up here. So without any further ado, I present to you Josh. All right, Zachariah, thank you so much. All right, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. So here we talk about a case about Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. And this is a very fitting place to talk about Obamacare because a chance, the constitutional challenge was born in this very state. Yes, your attorney general, joined by many others, invented and created the primary challenge to Obamacare. So we have to talk about here first is the constitutional challenge to the Affordable Care Act. Okay? Now, the Affordable Care Act was a very divisive piece of legislation that was being enacted. For many years, presidents have attempted but failed to institute some sort of massive health care reform for the United States. President Obama was able to push it through by the most narrowest of margins, but the political victory was quickly eclipsed by the constitutional fight. And in the book, which Zachariah mentioned, Unprecedented, I discussed this story, which I will share with you today. So the story of the Affordable Care Act really begins on President Obama's inauguration day. He decided that his first main priority, not immigration, not climate change, his first major social agenda would be health care reform. That was what he would put his attention on. And throughout most of 2009, there were efforts to propose this bill, propose this bill, and try and get something passed. Okay? But something very interesting happened on the way to the Portal Care Act. And that interesting thing is the Tea Party. Right? We don't hear about them much today, but if you think back to 2009, 2010, the Tea Party was a somewhat quasi-grassroots organization that sprung up out of nowhere. But their primary purpose in 2009 was to stop Obamacare. Groups started off very small and went on a larger and larger scale, having these massive rallies saying, we need to stop this law. But they didn't just oppose it on constitutional grounds. I'm sorry. They didn't just oppose it on policy grounds. They actually opposed it on constitutional grounds. They argued not only was this a bad law, this law was unconstitutional. And it was this movement that allowed the entire challenge to Obamacare to proceed. Yet despite these best efforts, to stop the law in the political process, they failed. On December 24, 2009, Christmas Eve, the Affordable Care Act passes through the, through the United States Senate on a 60 to 39 vote. It was a straight party line vote, which was just enough to break the filibuster because that's 60 votes. So at that point, everything looks great. There were 60 votes for Obamacare. This was going to sail through. Okay? But then something funny happened. Earlier that summer, Senator Ted Kennedy had passed away. He had spent decades of his life fighting for health care reform. And because he passed away, there was a vacancy in Massachusetts. And then something really funny happened. Scott Brown, a Republican, was elected to fill Senator Ted Kennedy's seat. Remember the guy, Scott Brown? He tried to run again for Senate New Hampshire. It didn't work either. So what's interesting is that because Scott Brown was now a Republican, he was now the 40th vote in the United States Senate for the Republicans. At this point, the Republicans could filibuster the bill. Okay? So it was a dilemma. The version of the bill passed on Christmas Eve in the Senate was not the final version. It was a draft bill. In fact, a lot of the problems we're seeing with the law now were directly resulting from the fact that we have a draft bill. The senators realized that if at any point this bill came back to the Senate, it would be filibustered and killed. 
So what was the option? What were they to do? Well, the easy way would be for the House to pass the Senate version of the bill. That way there would be a, there would be a Senate vote and a House vote. But that wasn't a possibility because, again, the Senate bill had lots of problems in it that the members of the House didn't like very much. So what do they do? They use this thing called budget reconciliation, which allows both houses to modify version of the bill without the filibuster. It's unsure if this is even an appropriate method, but by one way or another, on March 23rd, 2010, roughly five years ago, the Affordable Care Act was signed to law by the president. And the moment he signed it into law, he made a comment, something to the effect of, the battle over health care reform is over, right? In 2010, the president said something about, I'm paraphrasing, he said, the battle over health care reform is over. Uh, he could not have been more wrong, and I don't think he anticipated quite how wrong that would be. Ready for this, guys? Within 10 minutes of the ink drying on the page, within 10 minutes of the president's signature drying, your attorney general of Florida filed a lawsuit in Pensacola, not too far from here, challenging the legality of the Affordable Care Act. Moments later, the Attorney General of Virginia filed another suit. Now, I'll give you some inside baseball here, because you're Floridians, right? Why would the Attorney General of Florida, based in Tallahassee, file a lawsuit in Pensacola? Anyone want to take a guess? What? Forum shopping, yes, my friend, right. So, the, effectively, the district court in Pensacola had effectively four Republican appointees and then one senior Democrat judge. I might be getting numbers slightly off, but it was pretty it was pretty stacked. And I talked to people in the AG's office that we didn't want to file in Tallahassee. We didn't want to file in Gainesville. We didn't want to file in Miami. So we picked Pensacola. So, you know, as all good litigators, as you all be one day, form shopping is very important, both in terms of the Constitution and in terms of regular civil commercial litigation. So in any event, a constitutionalist challenge was filed in Florida before Judge Vinson in Pensacola. What was the nature of this challenge? Now, we have here three distinguished common law professors uh, who will be engaging with me later. But I can say with certainty that if I had asked any of them in 2009, could Congress regulate a multi-billion dollar industry that, 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 that provides health insurance to everyone? Professors, what, what would the answer have been? I wrote on that. Actually, as my common law students all know, I always say, Yes. And I could never have imagined that the Supreme Court majority would have actually even considered how the Congress brought a strike to the Senate. Exactly. So if you had asked any common law professor in 2009, could Congress pass the Affordable Care Act? The answer would be, duh, of course. We have, as Professor mentioned, with could be filbert. This was the case from the New Deal era where the court said if one farmer grows wheat on his farm and that wheat never even leaves his farm, that is interstate commerce. Why? Because it has a substantial effect in the aggregate on commerce in other states. Because if this guy's not buying wheat on the market, then he needs to affect prices elsewhere. Your decision locally affects everything, right? And this has been a, a supposedly black letter law now for almost 70 years, right? So how could it be that the Affordable Care Act was unconstitutional? So what was the argument advanced? The argument went something like this, and it was developed in large part by a professor named Randy Barnett, who wrote the foreword to my book and uh, is a friend of mine, so I'll, I'll summarize as, as best as I can. The way the Affordable Care Act operates is that it requires people who do not have health insurance to pay an amount of money every year. I'm using terms very precisely here. If you do not have a certain level of health insurance, you need to pay some amount of money every year. Okay? When the bill was originally being debated, People said, well, wait a minute, isn't this a tax? And every politician from the president on down said, no, this is not a tax, it's not a tax, it's not a tax. If you interview the Senate staffer, they oh my God, if we called this a tax, it never would have passed. It never would have passed, no way, no how. I said, okay, let's not call it a tax. Let's, in our constitutional findings for the law, call it a regulation on commerce. Let's just say, we're not charging people a tax, this is just a regulation on commercial activity. And if you read the constitutional findings, the taxing power is mentioned nowhere. But everything is heaped on the Commerce Clause. So again, as Professor said, what's the problem? Wickard, right? Well, this is where lawyering makes things different. This is where lawyering can kind of twist things on its head. So on the one hand, you can say, wow, this is regulating a multi-billion dollar commercial enterprise. But on the other hand, you can say, wait a minute, this law is doing something else. It's not just re regulating commercial activity. It's requiring people to engage in a commercial activity. 
This is not a regulation of activity, it's a regulation of inactivity. And by using the commerce power alone, with necessary and proper, to compel people into the stream of commerce, you are effectively making people engage in activity. And once you do that, there is no limiting principle, and the government can make you buy broccoli. Or so the argument goes, right? If the government can make you buy a product because it improves some sort of market, what can they not do? This is why the book was called Unprecedented. The argument against Obamacare boiled down to this one word. This is an unprecedented expansion of federal power by requiring people to engage in commercial activity. And once they engage in the commercial activity, we can regulate the hell out of them and charge them a penalty. They wouldn't get the argument, right? I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but this was the argument. And every law professor, except for maybe five in the country, said, this is ridiculous, this is stupid. You know, this is, someone said Rule 11 sanctions should be appropriate for this kind of complaint. Uh, uh, other people said that this is, this, is, this is almost as bad as Dred Scott. I mean, you, you can go up and, down the, the, up and down the rows, but these arguments emerged. But then something interesting happened, and, and we, we can discuss the reasons why. But Judge Vincent in Pensacola, not too far from here, issued an opinion. And this was a case brought on behalf of Florida and eventually 25 other states. Roughly half the states in the Union were challenging the constitutionality of Obamacare's mandate. And what did Judge Vincent find? He found that the law was unconstitutional. He found that Congress could not regulate inactivity, that this law compelled people to engage in, in, in activity. And he wasn't just making stuff up. There actually was some precedent. So if you actually go back and you read Wickard, and you read Gonzales v. Raich, the medicinal marijuana case, and you read Lopez, and you read Morrison, you'll see one word appears in every single opinion, activity. If you read Justice Scalia's concurring opinion of which I think was probably the real opinion of Raich, he uses the word activity. What did Judge Vincent say? We're not dealing here with activity. We are dealing with inactivity, people's decision not to have health insurance. If you're just sitting at home on your couch, you're not doing anything. But the government replied, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everyone needs health care at some point in life, right? Everyone's going to need health care. Aha, uh -huh, Judge Vincent replies, everyone may need health care. But not everyone may need health insurance, right? There's a difference. Health care is what a doctor provides you. Health insurance is something you pay for. So even though your decision not to have health insurance perhaps creates externalities, it creates free rider problems, that's absolutely true, it's not true that everyone will need this. And the government does not have the power to require you to finance your health care in advance. That's what Judge Vincent said. Judge Vincent's opinion, and then we can decide whether it was good or bad in that basis or not, effectively turned this argument from off the wall to on the wall. This made the argument have legs. This is not just some kooky law professors making this argument, and we are kooky people. This was a federal judge of some repute. I mean, he, he was, if you want to see this up, he was actually in the FISA court. He wrote some really interesting FISA opinions against President Bush. You want to see some interesting stuff. He actually told the Bush administration they cannot do this stuff with the uh, foreign intelligence surveillance. Very interesting opinion. So he had this opinion, well-respected judge, and we move on. Okay, so the case goes to the Courts of Appeals. Now, again, I'll keep my Florida-centric uh, 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 argument here. And the main event was in the 11th Circuit, your, your Court of Appeals in Atlanta. Okay, so what happened in Atlanta? We had an argument between Neil Katyal, who was then the acting Solicitor General, and Paul Clement, who was a former Bush Solicitor General. So you these two titans of law sparring in the ATL and deciding whether Congress could require people to engage in this activity. And the interesting thing about the argument before the 11th Circuit was that the opinion was a joint one. You had two judges, Judge Frank Hall and Judge Joel Dubina. They wrote a joint opinion finding that the, that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. Okay? So now, not only did you have a district court striking time, you had a circuit court striking time. And oh, by the way, this created a circuit split because the Sixth Circuit had already determined this law was valid. As I'm sure you all know, once you have a circuit split, that almost guarantees Supreme Court review. I have been on record saying the Supreme Court will never take this case. I was wrong. I've been wrong by a lot of things, my friends. So I was very wrong about that. So once there's a circuit split, SCOTUS basically had to take the case. And take the case they did. They didn't just give the regular, you know, 30 minutes for each side. They split this up over three days of arguments and almost six hours of time among almost like five different lawyers. This was, again, frankly, unprecedented. Not since I think Brown v. Board had a case of that many hours of arguments scheduled. Uh, uh, so this was a significant amount of time. So although I've been only talking about Commerce Clause for a bit, I want to talk about taxing power. And I'm going to bore you briefly, but I promise you it's important, okay? 
So today is what? April 13th. What happens on Wednesday? Taxes are due, right? So I'm sure some of you may not like your taxes very much. You may not agree with them. But I can promise you one thing. You have one option on April 15th and one option alone. Pay your taxes. If you don't agree with it, you can file a lawsuit in tax court saying, wait a minute, the IRS gave me the wrong bill. There was a mistake. There's a reason for this. It's called the Tax Anti-Injunction Act. If the IRS assesses you a tax, your only option is to pay it and then sue for a refund. Can you imagine the chaos that would ensue if people could say, oh, I'm not going to pay my tax. Let me go to court and sue for 15 years. No, no one would ever pay their taxes. There's a very good reason for this law. Okay, so the general idea is you can't pay, I'm sorry, you can't challenge a tax in court until you've actually paid it. So herein lies the dilemma. Didn't the government argue that Obamacare was a tax, that the mandate was actually a tax penalty? When was the Obamacare tax penalty going to kick in? Not 2010, not 2011, not even 2012, 2014. This year that just passed. So how could it be if in fact this was a tax that the court had jurisdiction? Shouldn't the case just be dismissed for lack of jurisdiction, get you to file it in two more years? Right? Well, that is actually how this entire case was resolved. Bizarrely, despite the, these wonderful column professors who come, Obamacare was decided on the basis of tax law, which is something which I knew nothing about when I started this enterprise. So how does this work? If Obamacare is actually a tax, right, then dismiss, no jurisdiction, follow back in 2014. If Obamacare is a regulation of commerce, okay, that's fine. We can have the case now, but you lose under the commerce clause. So how do you thread this needle, right? How can you do two things at once? And this was a genius of Solicitor General Don Verrilli's argument, which most people do not give him credit for. I give him a lot of credit. So this was his argument, right? He says, okay, check this out. This is a little confusing, so follow me. I'll use my hands, okay? So for purposes of the taxing power, right, the taxing power of the Constitution that gives Congress the power to impose tax on people, Obamacare is a tax, right? But for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act, this federal statute, it's actually a, a penalty. So for one purpose, it's a tax, and the other purpose, it's a penalty. That the same exact provision of Obamacare is a tax for purposes of the Constitution, but a penalty for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act. Why? Because if it's a penalty for that jurisdictional statute, you can hear the case now. But if it's a tax for the Constitution, you can uphold it. This was how Obamacare was decided. By looking at the same law with two different lenses, like Janus was serving two masters, the law was upheld. So effectively, the argument presented to the court is this. It's only a tax to uphold it, but once we decide jurisdiction, it's actually not a tax. That was the Obamacare argument. And that was the argument made to the Supreme Court. I'll tell you one more thing. That's the argument Chief Justice Roberts accepted. Mm. Everyone who said the Chief Justice made this up and got to that nowhere, no, this came right from the government's briefs. The argument the government accepted was one the Chief adopted. So we have the decision, Envy versus Sibelius. It was a confusing decision, in no small measure because the opinion was so long and so many people were intent on getting it right. So if you've ever seen this, it's actually pretty cool. There are no cameras in the court, we know this, right? So how do people get opinions from the court? Well, usually you go to their website. But like Obamacare.gov or healthcare.gov, that Supreme Court's website just tanked on decision day. It was offline. So the only way to get a copy of the opinion, you ready for this, was having a paper copy. And how do you get a paper copy of the opinion? You ready for this? You hire an intern to wait in line, run, and grab it. They actually have a thing called the running of the interns. It's really cute. Where these interns in their suits and sneakers stand their poise and they dart, you know, they, they dart and they run straight to the you know, reporters waiting on the street. But there's a problem. Right? What's the problem? When you have, and professors will acknowledge, a 200-page opinion you have to read quickly, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess stuff up. And boy, did they blow it. So CNN, headline news, right? Alerts to millions. Obamacare invalidated. Mandate struck down. Why would they report that? Why would they think that? Well, if you read the first 50 pages of the Chief Justice's opinion, that's what you would think. The first part of the Chief Justice's opinion said Obamacare is not a valid regulation on commerce, that Congress cannot compel people to engage in commercial activity. But if you can read to like page 51, right, you, you, the next page, you'll see where it says, oh, but by the way, the court has an obligation to read a statute in a way to make it constitutional. And we can construe this as a tax for purposes of the Constitution. We will uphold it. So everyone messed up, was so excited, the Commerce Clause, right? And then you get to page like 60. You get to the bit about the taxing power. 
And that's how the court upheld it. This decision from the Chief Justice, which basically was only joined by him alone, did this part, this funky analysis that was, 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 was dispositive, caused a divide in the court. We had from Justice Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito, a joint dissent. There was such anger, they wouldn't even put one name to it, they all joined in. And what did this joint dissent say? We would invalidate ACA in its entirety, root and branch. Get rid of it. Let Congress start out from scratch. This is not a valid method. The ACA came within a breath of invalidation. And the Chief Justice's vote, if you believe reporting in my book and elsewhere, wasn't always so served. Sure. At some point during deliberation, the Chief Justice decided, actually, I'm going to uphold this law as a tax using the government's argument. All right? So the ACA survived and lived to fight another day. But this was not the end of the battle of Obamacare. No, 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 my friends. In fact, there's so much other stuff. I'm writing a second book because, because you know, they keep giving me new material. So the next major challenge, of course, which we'll talk about with my friend professor here, is Hobby Lobby versus Burwell, the contraceptive mandate case. So this case involves a law, which I'm sure you're now all familiar with, called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or if you want to be cool, RIFRA, right? RIFRA. So what is RIFRA? RIFRA was passed in 1993 by almost a unanimous Congress, a voice vote in the House and a 97 to 3 vote in the Senate. What does RIFRA do? It says if any federal program imposes a substantial burden on religious exercise, right, the government must act in the most narrowly tailored way as possible. I'm summarizing, that's more or less the gist of the law. Right? The government can't impose substantial burdens to religion unless like, this, this is the only way they can accomplish this important governmental objective. So we have Obamacare. So here's a pop quiz. Does Obamacare have a contraceptive mandate? No, it doesn't. Surprise, surprise. Obamacare, the law itself, the Affordable Care Act, all it says is that certain screening and preventative methods for women shall be provided. Who determines what these screening processes are? Not Congress, they want nothing of that. Had Congress actually said that abortifacients are covered by the law, it would have never passed. Never, 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 never in 100 years. So they said, let some other bureaucratic agency, nameless face, decide what this is. So, ready? Health and human, Congress delegate to Health Human Services. Health and Human Services delegate to H called HRSA, who delegate to the Institute of Medicine, the IOM, which is a group of doctors you've never heard of. And they decided that what he provided are all FDA-approved contraceptive, including various abortifacients, such as Plan B and Ella, which basically the morning after pill as they're often known. So you have this bureaucratic agency that decides, you know what? We need Obamacare to cover this. Now, originally, who was exempted from providing contraceptives? Churches. Temples, mosques, that's it. What about religious nonprofits, such as the Little Sisters of the Poor, which is basically a group of nuns? Were they exempted from the mandate? Of course not. As originally drafted, the regs require the nuns to provide contraceptives to their fellow nuns, or whatever, whatever it's going to be, right? Um, this created a serious backlash. So the Obama administration said, okay, you know what? We're going to exempt these religious nonprofits, right? What about for profit corporations? And this teed up the case that became known as Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. Okay, Hobby Lobby, do they have them here? Yeah, okay, they're everywhere except for where I live in. I'm from New York, I've never seen a Hobby Lobby in my life. But they have them in Texas. So Hobby Lobby is a craft store that's owned by the Green family. Uh, the, in fact, the entire board of directors is the same family. If you ever see their corporate board meeting, it looks like an Easter portrait because they're all together in pastels. It's very cute. So the Green family uh, 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 found a Hobby Lobby not just to sell frames and whatever arts and craft stuff, but to glorify God, and that's their mission. They make that very clear. They close on Sundays, they provide counseling to their employees, they donate significant amounts of time and money to various Christian charities. Um, this is a business that, that's meant primarily to serve God by creating crafts, okay? Whatever, that, 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 that's, their, that's their business. I said crafts, not, not something else, okay? I'm not artistic, I have no idea. I went, I, <laughs> I actually have a funny story. So I sent copies of my book to all the justices uh, as, a, you know, as a courtesy, as, and a couple of them sent me letters back so I want to frame my letter from the justices in the Hobby, in the hobby Lobby frame. <laughs> but, you know, Justice Sotomayor's letter instead of Hobby Lobby frame. That might actually uh, might be poetic, I suppose. I don't know. So we have Hobby Lobby. And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, federal government. RIFRA, right? RIFRA 
This law imposes a duty on the government. You can impose a burden on religious beliefs and requiring us to provide insurance which covers contraceptives, including abortifacients, which are basically plan B, morning after pill, right? These violate our freedom of exercise. We mean our. Who is our? The corporation? The Green family? The board of directors? So the key in this case is that RIFRA says person. Who is a person for purposes of the Religious Freedom Act? Well, if you look at the Supreme Court's opinion and uh, the majority opinion, it says you look at the Dictionary Act. And the Dictionary Act says 1 U.S.C. 1, the very first page of the U.S. Code, the word person in a statute can refer to a corporation. But that's not entirely dispositive. I think the more uh, uh, important way of thinking about it is what is a corporation? It's a group of people who pursue a common goal. I know there's been a huge kerfuffle about Citizens United and creating corporate personhood. Um, this is not a fairly new idea. If you look at Peercy Society of Sisters and other cases going back 100 years, various corporations exercise constitutional rights. This is not a novel idea, although people like to make a big deal about it. What happens here is that the fact that people choose a corporate form to use to exercise religious beliefs should not deprive of that. Think about it. A church is a corporation. The little sister of the poor, corporation, right? So I think ultimately the opinion Hobby Lobby was correct on that ground. And in fact, only Justice Ginsburg and Sotomayor said that these corporations cannot get birth protections. Kagan and Breyer, oddly, didn't join that part of the opinion, which means they probably couldn't pull their nose enough for that one. But in any event, we have the opinion in Hobby Lobby saying that RIFRA imposes substantial burdens on religious exercise. I'm sorry, that the contraceptive mandate imposes substantial burdens. This case will probably go back up to the court based on what happened afterwards, right? So after Hobby Lobby, the Obama administration said, OK, you know what, guys? Fine. We'll give you an accommodation. You don't have to pay for these. Just write us a letter, OK? Write us a letter telling us that you object to providing these contraceptives. Do you think that accommodation was accepted? No. So Hobby Lobby basically filed another, well, they, they amended their complaint saying that this new accommodation itself violates religious liberties. The mere act of sending a letter to the government saying we do not want to provide these services, that is a substantial burden of religious exercise. Um, the technical argument is that by sending this letter, they're identifying who the insurance provider is, and that puts in place the triggering of processes that leads to the uh, provisioning of these products. I'm not so optimistic they'll win this one. I think they'd be pushing their luck, but I, you know, I, I, I'm usually wrong about these things, so I offer no predictions. Okay. The final case I want to talk about is one that's pending for the Supreme Court right now. King versus Burwell. And unfortunately, this is the most boring of the cases I was talking about, like Obamacare has broccoli and Hobby Lobby has birth control. This is about tax subsidies, which are not very interesting. Okay? So the way the Affordable Care Act was designed and structured was to ensure that people could have affordable health insurance. Okay? And how does this work? By the government throwing lots of money at it. Surprise, surprise, Obamacare does almost nothing to control costs. This was one of the compromises made. Obamacare does not control costs. And if you want to read a book, good book, Stephen Brill, called Bitter Pill, Obamacare does not really control costs. What it does is it throws money at the problem. So I read a good example. It's like putting you know, new, new tires on a rusty bicycle, right? You know, it'll look nicer, but whatever. So the way Obamacare makes it health care more affordable is by giving subsidies. And where do you buy health insurance? Well, you're all in Florida. Maybe you've done it. You go on to healthcare.gov, right? Why? Because your state elected not to build an Obamacare exchange, as in my state, as in 34 other states. But here's the issue. There's a section of the law, which most people will never actually read, that says subsidies can be paid out in states that establish exchanges. I'm paraphrasing the long statute, but basically says if there's an exchange established by the state, you can get subsidies. So, for example, if you're in New York or California and you log on to their subsidy website or their exchange website, you get these subsidies. Fine, no problem. But what happens if you buy insurance on the Florida version of healthcare.gov, which is established not by the state but by the federal government? Can you get the subsidies? The case pending right now before the Supreme Court, we decided any minute, and for the record, I filed a brief in it on behalf of Cato. This case pending right now decides whether people in 34 states excuse me, stand to lose the subsidies being paid out. Okay, so what are the arguments here, right? So on the one side, you have the challenge. Like, listen, read the stats, right? Read, read the damn text. It's very clear. It says, exchange established by the state. This was a specific term used to say that only subsidies for states established exchanges can be paid out. So for Florida, you guys are out of luck. Okay? 
What's the government's argument? They say, well, well, no, don't be so formalistic, right? Read the entire statute to gain context, right? Read the entire law, and you'll see that this was a, a law meant to provide a subsidy for as many people as possible. There's no evidence that Congress intended to limit the subsidy to these states' establishment changes, and this would put the entire law into a death spiral because once Floridians can no longer get these subsidies, they will stop paying for health insurance. And once they stop paying for health insurance, only the sick people will be in the market. And because there are only sick people in the market, premiums will go through the roof. Right? This is the adverse selection death spiral, like down the toilet. Right? Once healthy people, the young invincible, stop buying insurance, your entire market goes to the crap. Right? So who's right? Well, I mean, I have my opinion on this one because I filed a brief in this case. But I think this case uh, uh, is something of a toss-up. I, I don't make predictions anymore, but I think this one's pretty close. Uh, because I can see the court coming out um, either way on this decision. So what does all this mean, right? I have one book on Obamacare. I'm going to have to write a second book and probably a third before I'm done with it. Um, this law, which was born in partisan strife, okay, it was passed in a straight party line vote in the Senate and nearly uh, not a single Republican voted for it in the House, right? What, what does this mean? Um, unlike other major pieces of social legislation, Social Security, uh, American Disabilities Act, the Civil Rights Act, these were all bipartisan acts. Obamacare was not. What does that mean? Well, on the one hand, perhaps Republicans wanted nothing to do with this law, and I think that, that's probably true. But even with that being said, half the country hates this law, and it's barely peaked about 50% popularity. Going forward, whereas a reasonable Congress who liked the law would make you know, changes here, changes there, tweak here, tweak there, half the country wants to appeal the damn thing. So I think there's a lesson to be learned that when you're trying to engage in massive social change that affects a lot of things, um, bipartisanship matters. And the absence of it, it's not to say, let's do it, let's pass the law and find out what's in it later, right, as Nancy Pelosi said. Let's, let's worry about the details later, right? The details are now. We have Obamacare, we have Hobby Lobby, we have King D. Burwell, and about three other cases I didn't mention, which will be coming down the pike. And all these cases will pose existential threats to the Affordable Care Act itself, uh, not the least of which who wins the next presidential election, because serious damage can be done, both sides. Uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act has lots of benefits. The benefits are front-loaded. The subsidies, insurance, whatever, the painful stuff kicks in later. So get ready for the Cadillac tax, folks, in 2018. Uh, if you have a generous health care plan, it'll be canceled because it's too generous and your employer will just drop you. Uh, uh, Zeke Emanuel, Rob Emanuel's brother, said within a decade, almost all Americans will be on the Obamacare exchanges. So this is not going anywhere. This is a problem we'll have for a long time. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my friend who will talk a little bit more about Hobby Lobby. Uh, but I welcome all of your questions later. Uh, thank you so much. I'll pick up on uh, one of Josh's themes about how the debate about the Affordable Care Act raises larger questions about the expansion of federal governmental power. I teach a course in law and religion, which is largely a First Amendment course, where we also teach RIFRA, which has become more protective of free exercise rights than uh, the, first, the First Amendment itself. And we look at the, the history of the First Amendment's adoption in that course. Uh, a lot of us would think, listening to commentary today, that the, there's a strict wall of separation between government and religion, between public life and religion, religion being something appropriate to the private sphere but not the public. And one of the things that I try to emphasize in the, the First Amendment course is how even if you adopt a, a Jeffersonian or Madisonian view, which they articulated as president about keeping religion out of their administrations, that's only part of their view. The other part of the view was Madison never conceived that Congress would have any power to legislate in any way that would directly affect religion. And Jefferson believed in a extremely limited powers of federal government, although he may have exceeded that in the, in the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Let Jefferson, among other things, uh, believed in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions that states could nullify laws with which they disagree. The point is this, that even to the extent that there is a plausible historical argument for separating government and the other sectors, private or however you want to define them, there's been a major change in the expansion of government 
Uh, there's been a major expansion of government over the past two centuries. Uh, I think you would agree that uh, Jefferson could not have imagined a, a national health care plan, could not have imagined the role that federal and to a lesser extent state government have in education and providing social services, which were largely provided into the 20th century by nonprofits and particularly religious nonprofit organizations. So one of the interesting things about the Hobby Lobby case is that it, it brings to our attention how 18th century notions about the proper sphere of government and political life and religion and private life don't really work well anymore because of the dramatic expansion of government, which led to the problem that the, the Greens, um, Conestoga company addressed in Hobby Lobby. It was a very small little dispute in a way, and I was a bit perplexed that um, HHS didn't avoid it altogether. As Josh pointed out, there were 20 contraceptives that had to be part of the health insurance plan. Four of them, according to the Greens, uh, and this was probably a minority view on the scientific issues, uh, four of them, like the morning after pill, were deemed to be abortifacients by the plaintiffs. The government didn't contest that point. There are a number of medical commentators that said, well, an abortion occurs when you take uh, an embryo that's been planted on the wall of the uterus and terminated existence, not when you intervene in that four or five days between the time you have a, uh, an embryo, a fertilized egg, and the implantation, which is where the four contraceptives they objected to uh, took effect. Now, I don't share the, the Green's view about when human life comes into existence. I, in my younger days, when it mattered, I purchased contraceptives. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I tend to support uh, early, early pregnancy abortions, a, a woman's right to choose. So in listening to the religious or moral argument that the plaintiffs uh, or the closely held corporation presented, it isn't a social issue with which I have a strong agreement. And maybe I don't agree at all. But it did seem unnecessary for me for the uh, HAS, without having specific mandate of Congress, to force the issue. These people sincerely believe what they said, even if medically you could dispute uh, their definition of an abortifacient. Uh, this was uh, the case of the family. They took the Marines take, took very good care of their employees, gave them very good health care benefits, like those we have at Stetson. And these were sincere people who were willing to close down the store on Sunday, Hobby Lobby, that is, despite the loss. So as even the dissenting justices point out, this was an attractive group of folks to assert a religious freedom claim. The, so I don't quite understand why the issue was forced because as the majority opinion said, you could do what was done with the religious nonprofits and simply make the insurance companies bear the cost of these four little so-called abortifacients and avoided the conflict with their religious beliefs. And I just don't understand why this issue had to be pressed in this way. Uh, at the same time, having uh, given one journalist interview on this topic, I was disappointed in the way this issue about the extension of RIFRA to for-profit companies really wasn't talked about in that way. Instead, it seemed to be an issue between anti and pro-abortion, anti-pro-conception groups. And as I already declared to you that I tend to be on the side of contraception, at least early pregnancy abortion. Um, but that's not what the issue was about. Uh, the issue was about whether this closely held company would be able to enter into the uh, commercial sphere and still claim the right to exercise religious freedom based on a view I don't share, but they did. And the, the lack of solicitude for their beliefs, the way they were disparaged in, in some of the commentary, 
disappointed me because the basic notion of the civil liberty is even if we don't agree with those people, we think their position's wrong-headed, we do respect the fact that they, that we should take serious their liberty that they're claiming, mistaken or not. And I was disappointed that more people didn't see it that way. And there was um, a lack of, I think, respect for their position on this. And really, that's uh, all I have to say. I think my colleagues will probably offer more critical responses on it. But I, I do see the Hobby Lobby case as an illustration of where government unnecessarily created a conflict and unnecessarily encroached on a liberty interest when they didn't have to, to protect the woman's right to have contraceptives in their insurance plans. All right, we have, well, time to wrap up at web here at one. Okay. okay, so we'll finish soon. All right, so I'll, I'll extend the courtesy of the uh, prerogative to my, my colleagues over here. If you have any questions or things you'd like to ask. I, I guess my question is, what is your end game? Um, do you want the ACA to be repealed? And if the ACA is um, repealed, what do you see taking its place? Oh, I don't have much of an issue on the policy. Uh, people always ask, I don't really care. It, it, people don't believe me when I say this, but actually, I actually don't care what happens to Obamacare. I really don't. I don't get to really like it, but if the Democratic process wants to keep it, fine. If the next president wants to repeal it, fine. To replace something better or worse, you know, I, I'm somewhat ambivalent. My my conception is a rule of law and enumerated powers. That's what gets me going in the morning. Um, and to the extent that the law violates that, then I think the courts have a prerogative to step in. But your question is a fair one. If you replace it, then what comes after it? Is it better or worse? You know, I have no idea. Thank you, sir. So to that point, the, uh, the rule of law and the separation of powers, the end of your presentation suggested that President Obama and those after his four the Affordable Care Act should have bipartisan support. If they have, we may not be seeing the results in the courts that we're seeing today. That suggests that the courts are actually entirely partisan and are taking a political stand in most, if not all, respects, which is really anti, I think, their role in the separation of powers and in the rule of law. Is that... Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think the courts, I mean, the, the critique that the courts are partisan goes back to John Marshall, right? This, this, this is nothing new. Um, but what, what I would say is that for the most part, I think the court's standing on doctrine, right? The Obamacare case, you may not like it or not, but the word activity appeared in all those opinions. And we ask you if that's not activity. Uh, you have the Hobby Lobby decision, and whether perhaps you like it or not, the corporate dictionary says corporation. Uh, uh, and you have King v. Burwell, whether you like it or not, the statute is established by the states. So these aren't, you know, some sort of opinions where it's making stuff up out of left field, right? You know, I, 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 you teach some opinions from the Warren Court in your case. They're like, okay, don't actually look at the logic. Just look what, you know, we, ha we have opinions. So I, I think at least his opinions try to ground themselves in precedent to the best they can. I think the judges look at it in an honest and forthright manner. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that these are the opinions that are um, making stuff up. But I, I see your point strongly that these are partisan issues. And the court is injecting itself into a debate of significant and nationwide proportions. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's very difficult when you have these five, four decisions come out the way they do. So one quick follow-up for some activity and activity distinction, which I think is actually false or misleading, because even this dissent points out that what we have is $100 million worth of health care going to people who claim that they are not consumers, that they are not going to be in the health care market, but they actually are. So there's a falsehood there that's actually not well, they're not consumers at the moment. They'll be consumers in the future. And they have been in the past as a group. Not as, oh, as a group, for, for, but this, yeah, the mandate operates in individuals. Oh. Right, but, but the, the issue is the difference between health care and health insurance, right? Everyone will need health care. Everyone has had health care. Not everyone will need health insurance, and that's the distinction the majority drew. Maybe that distinction is bunk, right? But that, that is how the courts distinguish it, and I, I, I think it's persuasive, but uh, I don't know. Um, we have time for some student questions, and I will go back to professors, but I want to make sure students have an opportunity also to, is that okay? So any questions from students? Oh, come on. Yes. Oh, you betcha. Right. So the question was, in case you can hear it, if the court in Val <laughs> well, if Obamacare survives TV Burrow, which is a very deep question, I don't know what that even means, but 
After King v. Burrell, there are more cases. So one involves the origination clause, right? That's impending forever. The Constitution says taxes must originate in the House of Representatives. If Obamacare is a tax, it should originate in the House. Where did it begin? In the Senate. So this case is actually tricky because there's something called a shell bill. And what a shell bill is? Get ready for this, right? Someone, some smart lawyer in the Senate said, OK, we're going to have this tax issue maybe. Let's take some random bill from the House that has nothing to do with Obamacare. It's about veterans' rights. Let's gut it and put Obamacare into it. It's like putting it into a shell, like of an egg, right? So technically, Obamacare originated in this House shell bill. Um, I don't find that argument very persuasive, but if that argument works, or if that argument fails, I should say, the mandate becomes an unconstitutional tax and the entire law unravels. By the way, just tie my next book is Unraveled. Uh, so that's, <laughs> you see where I'm going with that, right? Uh, what else is there? There's more contraceptive challenges. There's challenges in the spending power. I didn't even have time to mention it. One of the important aspects of Obamacare is that seven justices said that Obamacare is coercive on the states. That threatening states withhold all this money is actually coercive. There's a challenge now from Maine, the case called Mayhew versus Burwell, that says that HHS threatened to withhold all of this money if Maine didn't provide Obama, uh, uh, you know, Medicare to all the Medi Medicaid to all the different people. So that's pending. Um, there are others which haven't even been filed yet. There's stuff on risk corridors and you know, we. What failed in the political process turned out to what we call lawfare, right? It's not warfare, but lawfare. Using litigation as a tool to strike down policies you don't like. And I'll, I'll see my friend's point. There, there is a strong partisan aspect to that. And uh, maybe I'm guilty. I followed a brief in, in King v. Burwell. Uh, but at least for me, I think there are serious real law issues that, that need to be adhered to by the courts. Zachariah saying, does that mean we're done? Yes, I have one point. Uh, the Attorney Please. General, uh, that John Thank you very much. We have a couple gifts that we'd like to present to Josh and our professors who helped today. So those are being brought up by Savannah. We have a gift for you and one for Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, Becky.